Hello and welcome back. We're now on lesson eight and today we're going to look at business markets. We've obviously already looked at consumer markets and as we've already stated that there's a, a big difference in how they operate, how we approach them, how we deal with them. So we're going to go through that now. Things that we're going to be looking at here. What is the business market? How does it differ from the consumer market? What buying situations do organizational buyers face? Who participates in the B2B buying process? How do business buyers make their decisions? And how can companies build strong relationships with business customers? And we'll also be looking at uh, how institutional governments do their buying as well. Organizational buying is the decision-making process by which formal organizations establish the need for purchased products and services and identify, evaluate, and choose amongst alternative brands and suppliers. The main business markets that we um, are aware of, if you think, uh, transport and distribution, a massive market if you consider all the, everything connected, purchase and, and maintenance of aircraft and trucks and cars and vans, so everything that is connected with that. Agriculture, obviously, is also another massive market. Construction, uh, forestry for everything, uh, wood that's used in those same uh, companies, manufacturing, the actual manufacturing of products banking and finance, and of course, communications, which literally is everything from, from your cell phone or a modem up to satellites. Now, there are obviously some similarities between the business, selling to businesses and selling to consumers. So in both cases, you would need to understand very deeply the consumer needs, those that are buying off you, regardless if it's a consumer, an individual, or if it's a company. Both you need to identify areas for growth, improve value management techniques, calculate better marketing metrics, competing and growing global markets, countering product commoditization and gain support uh, for the marketing channels. Some of the main differences, though, however, that there are. I suppose in the, in the first essence with the difference of buying is done much more on a professional basis we tend to think of people just buying larger amounts but it's much more complicated than that we as individuals we've just gone through the the process of the characteristics of a buyer of a consumer and in many cases it's done either on impulse or for, for non-logical methods when we buy something we see something we like it we buy it but with companies, maybe they, they either have a, con, uh, a professional buyer within the organization. It's their job to actually define what it is the company needs, go out and source it. And it's one person on a professional or even a group of people that are professionally there for one purpose, to buy items for that company. Generally speaking, there are very few and larger buyers. So uh, we're not buying, you know, selling to them one at a time. They're not buying one car or two or three. They're buying thousands. But again, there are millions of these consumers. There are perhaps thousands, thousands of companies. Generally speaking, they are more geographically concentrated. They're not spread out across uh, uh, the, the entire uh, country or continent or whatever. Mostly they're concentrated in more commercial areas on the coastlines, on the center of the, and in larger conurbations. And in many cases, the actual form of dealing with somebody is done on a, obviously on a, a personal level, uh, but it's mostly done on, um, when we purchase something, in most cases, it's just a one hit. We go in, we see it, we buy it. In many cases in businesses, because of the nature of the thing, it requires multiple sales calls. It requires us to go back again and again. So in that case, it can be much more complicated. Other differences, well, multiple buying influences, such as buying committees, which can be comprised of very many different uh, experts, technical experts and senior management. Some are responsible for different kinds of uh, aspects of what they would analyze and decide their likelihood of buying that product. Um, and direct purchasing, so large volume customers purchase directly from a manufacturer rather than buying from uh, lots of intermediaries. 
Another difference in the consumer market, the types of demand. Now we looked at demand before, uh, the different types of demand. Now we have here what's called derived demand. So in the business market, it depends on the demand from the consumer market. If we're selling to a supermarket, well, they of course get their demand derived from the consumers. And obviously all the things that are affected to them that affects their demand affects us as well but perhaps even more so. So if there is a case of economic growth, that means that consumers require more and they require more business goods. Inelastic. Well, generally speaking, for many businesses and goods, it's inelastic. In other words, it's not actually affected too much by change in price. The, the purchase of when you're dealing with businesses, regardless if the, the, the price in itself uh, goes up, they still require to buy large amounts. So whereas in a consumer market, a small increase in price may mean consumers stop buying our particular product. It's not that uh, likely in business markets. <clears throat> and of course, a fluctuating demand. If you consider that the, the, our, the end user may be consumers and we're supplying uh, an intermediary such as a supermarket, when there is just a small difference or small fluctuation, in the consumer market, that can be a vast difference in the business market that is supplying them. So literally a 2% fluctuation in the consumer market can mean a 20% change in the business market. Then the buying situations again. Well, we have various options. We can just do when we run out of something to a straight rebuy. In other words, we buy exactly the same thing we bought before because we've just run out of the product and we need to stock up. However, we may need to do what is called a modified rebuy. We're buying something similar, maybe from the same supplier, but we need to buy something different. A particular brand is selling more or customers have asked for something else so we would change it. Or we may buy a situation where it's a totally new thing that we need and we have to literally start from scratch, either looking uh, for new suppliers for us or asking our existing suppliers if they have them. Also, because of uh, buying now, we may not necessarily uh, buy direct. In, in other words, if we're a buyer and we have a contractor that is the person that is supplying us, especially if it's something complicated like a, a building or some kind of large project. If you can imagine um, the, um, the Panama Canal, a vast enterprise, there was a prime contractor. In other words, there was one company that the buyer went to, the government went to them and said, right, we want you to do this. But obviously they didn't have absolutely everything available for them. So they had to go down to a lower series of contractors who would supply particular parts for them. They would supply the gate doors and others would supply the diggers and would, would, would be the explosive experts. So the buyer only deals with the prime contractor and then the prime contractor is the one that deal with what we call the second tier contractors. Now that obviously makes it much easier for the buyer, but the prime contractor then has to deal with all the others and they then are responsible only to him and not to the actual end user being the buyer in this case. Now, systems buying originated with the government awarding contracts for weapons and communication systems. The firm, the buyer, solicitates, solicits bids from prime con contractors that, if it's awarded the bid, would be responsible for assembling the subcomponents of the system from the second tier contractors. Many organisations have turned the process around now by adopting a system selling as a marketing tool. So the contractor, the seller, approaches a potential buyer and offers to provide all the organization's MRO, the maintenance, repair and operating supplies. So system selling is a, is a key strategy in bidding on large scale industrial projects such as dams, pipelines and factories, etc. The, the actual buying participants, if you consider that you're going to sell to a particular company, you've got to be uh, aware that there's different types of levels of people that you'll be going through when you first approach it's highly unlikely that you'll be getting the, the the person that's going to be making the decision immediately so in the first instance your contact within an organization if you would think of maybe something along the lines of, a, of selling a, a software system it starts out maybe with a user, someone who is initiating the actual source because they know there's a new software system that's needed. You approach them. That is the person that is going to be using the system. 
but they have to go through their bosses and someone who has an influence on this. Maybe it's a technical person within the organization, head of IT or something along those lines. They have an influence because they know the particular kinds of products that are available. They would make a recommendation where it would go to someone who would actually decide, probably a manager, some kind of management level, they would make a decision on a particular selection of a product. It would then have to be approved by somebody else. So it would then go through an approval system, usually a board director or senior manager, they would approve the purchase. It then has to go through to the buyer. Sometimes we have the gatekeepers that are involved when you're trying to contact these people. Secretaries and receptionists can, can literally form a barrier between you and the customer. And then finally, the buyer themselves, which may be a group or an individual within the organization that will do the buying. So it's all the way up with one side and then back down the other way to, to eventually get the purchase done, which obviously is far more complicated, far more time consuming than, and, and more expensive to go through this uh, than dealing with consumers. Now, the buying center influences well, these are, there can be um, different kinds of people because obviously based on what interest they have in the, uh, the purchase, uh, is it of their interest or not? Is it in their interest to have a particular brand or not a particular uh, supplier? What authority do they have? Do they have actually any authority to stamp and approve things, to actually give a certain amount of money or not? What status do they have? Um, what kind of persuasiveness is needed for those and what is their decision criteria? So all these people differ in so many different things and we have to remember that if someone is not particularly persuasive that they don't need that or they don't have high status, how much are we going, time are we going to dedicate to this person? What do we need to do? So we can approach the, let's say, the lower ends of a certain level and that will change as we go through the um, the buying process, depending on the influences that, that, that are there. And then who to target? Well, targeting the firms and the buying centers. Obviously, what we need to do is find out who it is that, that is likely to be buying our products and then target specifically those people that we need. So we have to target the right people. Firms should uncover those business sectors that have high future growth potential the most profitable customers and the most promising opportunities. So once target firms are identified, now they must determine how best to sell to them. So some of the, the uh, what we have to do once we've decided that we have a, a potentially good customer, we've got to determine who are the major decision makers within that organization. And what decisions do they influence? What is their level of influence? Because maybe they have to, if they're head of IT and they have to influence somebody else, their bosses, how, what is their level to be able to influence them? And what evaluation criteria do they use? What is important to them? Is it based purely on function? Is it based on cost? And we have to be aware of that as well. So there's an awful lot of analyzing and research that has to go in before we can even approach any potential customers. So the purchasing or procurement process, buyers typically seek to obtain the highest benefit package from the products and services they purchase in relation to the overall cost of the offering. To compare the offering of one company to another, they will translate costs and benefits into monetary, into monetary terms. So as such, the marketers must develop a profitable offering that delivers superior customer value, but in uh, numerical terms that can be shown and then proven. Because in many cases, when you're actually talking to someone who is a buyer, he may not be a particular expert in what it is that you're dealing with. They want to see it in, in purely in terms of, of uh, value. In other words, the benefits versus the cost. Stages in the buying process, we, we, we saw this before when we were looking at the, the tyres for the consumer. So it's similar in some way, but obviously it's a little bit more complicated. We start again with the problem recognition, but then we have to develop a description of some characteristics of that which is required. So an additional step. Then we go on to the supplier search, maybe a proposal solicitation where people give proposals. We then select a particular supplier, then have the order specifications given, and then we have to have a review for the performance later on of how successful that purchase was. In other words, did that product do what it was supposed to do? 
the problem of recognition. Now, the internal stimuli for that, we've looked at how it was individually. It, obviously, it's completely different in business terms. Now, an internal stimulus might be something as simple as having low levels of stock we need to replace. A machine has broken down, or maybe a new product has been developed. Now, an external stimuli is similar again in advertisements that will have um, an effect on us, but maybe trade shows as well. We've seen something at a trade show that would stimulate us to actually realize that we have a problem that is available to be solved. The description and characteristics, well, now we're looking at technical specifications, maybe things like reliability, durability, how long it's going to last, the actual cost, purchasing cost, operating costs, etc. So the product value analysis is an approach to cost reduction that studies whether components can be redesigned or standardized or made by cheaper methods of production without affecting the profit, uh, the product performance. The supplier search, where can we get our uh, supplies from? Usually from things like tech trade directories or maybe advertisements from trade, trade shows. And obviously this can be done online or in physical but uh, those are the usual sources where we get um, our suppliers from. Electronic market, marketing places uh, take numerous forms, including catalog sites, uh, vertical markets, pure play auction sites, spot markets, private exchanges, barter markets, and buying alliances. The supplier's task is to ensure that they are considered when customers are or could be in the market for searching for a supplier. Marketing must work together with sales to define what makes a sales ready prospect and cooperate to send the right message via sales calls, trade shows, uh, online activities, public relations, events, direct mail and referrals. Stages in the buying process continued the proposal solicitation. Buyers, once they've, um, after they've got their suppliers, they've selected the, the ones that they're interested in, would invite those suppliers to submit proposals. Now, complex or expensive items will require written and detailed proposals that suppliers who make the cut may often be required to make formal presentations of their proposal, usually to a group of people. Now, this may be a group of people who are aware of the technical aspects of the product. Others may not be. Formal presentations, sometimes it must be in writing, so you must be skilled in researching, writing and presenting proposals. Materials should stress the value and the benefits in customer terms, terms that the customer is going to understand. If you're selling a, um, a very sophisticated software system to a company, they may not want to know all the details of how the software works. What they want to know is how much is it going to cost? How much are we going to make from it? What are going to be the benefits, the tangible benefits to us? Supplier selection. Buyers will often specify and rank desired supplier attributes, often using a uh, supplier evaluation model. In some cases, companies are reducing the overall number of suppliers they deal with. They want to choose suppliers who can be responsible for large component systems. So marketers should develop compelling value propositions and understand how buyers arrive at their valuations. Now, it may be that uh, in many cases, if they have a larger number of suppliers, it makes the possibility of running out of a particular supply more unlikely. Uh, but most of the time, it makes things far more simplistic. If they have less supplies, they always know who to go to, and it makes the flow of the products much smoother and easier. The order specification. Now we're looking at particular aspects, the technical specifications, exactly. Uh, what size or details exactly of the product, the amount, the quantity that they're ordering, and the delivery time. In other words, not necessarily the, the overall quantity, but they, they need the when and how those are, are delivered. Is it a thousand a day or 8,000 a week or 30,000 a month? So when and how many are, there, uh, are being delivered? What is their return policy? In other words, if maybe we uh, ha either have too many that we don't want, that we're not using, um, if some of the products are damaged, what is the, that? So in other words, warranties are also included. What guarantees do we have? 
We have a thing called a stockless purchase plan of the idea, obviously it's very expensive for companies to have stock. In other words, to actually receive the amount of stock that they're going to need over a purchase of a, uh, over the time period, say of a month. So we don't, companies don't tend to want because of all the additional costs of, of storing it and securing it on site. So a stockless purchase plan would be that we've agreed to buy a certain amount over a particular period, but we would only take delivery of them as we need them. So we don't have vast piles of stock. So it could mean we're getting deliveries on a daily basis, although really we have already purchased a month's supply. After selecting supplies, then they negotiate the final order. So depending on the product, the buyer may end up leasing the product. Obviously, the advantage of leasing is you get the latest product, better service. Use less capital and there's obviously lots of ta uh, tax advantages. For maintenance, repair and operating MRO items, buyers are beginning to use stockless purchase plans, blanket contracts that establish long term relationships. Here, the supplier agrees to resupply the buyer as needed at an agreed upon price over a specific period of time. And then finally, the performance review. Now, obviously, after we've um, purchase something and we've been using it or we need to know if um, basically we're using the right suppliers so buyers periodically review the performance of chosen suppliers using one of the three methods a buyer's contract end users uh, and ask for their evaluations of the products in other words they get in touch with the end users and find out how they have um, uh, evaluate or how they value the product Rate the supplier on several criteria using a weighted score method, depending on what kind of things are important to them, or aggregate the cost of poor performance to come up with adjusted costs of purchasing, such as price. If we have here, say, um, a buy grid framework, this is once we've, we already have our supplier. If it's uh, whether, depending on the kind of thing that we're going to be buying, are we going to be buying with uh, the same um, purchase or is it going to be a rebuy? Remember, if it's a totally new task, if it's a modified rebuy, if it's a straight rebuy. Now, problem recognition is there, uh, with a new task, yes. A uh, modified rebuy, yes. Straight rebuy, no. We already are aware of what it is that we need. Uh, general needs description, same again. Product specifications with a new task, there will be one. With a rebuy, there will be one. With a modified, they will have one. Um, a supplier search, well, with a straight rebuy, probably not. Maybe with a modified rebuy, if they are able to supply those products. If it's, a, it's the same product with a different specification, maybe they have it. If they don't, then obviously you're going to be looking for a new supplier. Uh, proposal solicitation, same again, and with supplier. Performance review, well, probably with all of them. How do we manage our business to business relationships? Well, closer relationships are driven in part by supply chain management, early supplier involvement and purchasing alliances. So cultivating the right relationship is paramount for any holistic marketing program. Don't forget is if you're trying to satisfy the customer based on your particular products, that they are quality and arrive on time, that will depend on where you get your stuff from, from, from your business supplier. If your things arrive late, you're going to be delivering to the consumer late. So it's going to have a knock on effect of you delivering to someone of them delivering to the end user. So all the time we have to be aware of this. So we're focusing more on attracting and retaining the right customers and developing a one to one marketing approach, because obviously in most cases in business to business marketing, one particular target customer may mean the difference for the, the survivability of the company. It's a bit like if Air, um, Airbus gets a, a new order for Emirates Airlines, if they get uh, an order with them or they uh, get them as a customer and they're buying 200 aircraft, that could mean the difference of the company surviving or not. And that was one to one marketing, obviously basing everything on the needs of the customer. Vertical coordination. Companies are looking to move away from transactional relationships. In other words, you come in, you buy something, and the, the transaction is completed. So instead, focusing on activities that create value for both parties, 
One key factor is greater vertical coordination in building trust between parties. So relationship factors, availability of alternatives, the importance of supply, the complexity of supply, the supply market dynamism. Different seller relationship categories. Right, obviously at the center of this we have our favorite one, customer, the customer is king. We often get asked, is the customer always right? Well, no, but the customer is always king. So it's always keep that in mind because obviously without customers, we don't have a business, we have a hobby. So we want to have systems of cooperation. In other words, we're working with what the company wants and what we can give the company, our, our supply, uh, <clears throat> our customer. We want to collaborate, we want to work together with them. Maybe they have particular requirements for certain things that we're offering. They may want to change in particular uh, products. We have to be aware of this and we have to be flexible. Uh, with contractual transactions, well, obviously we're going to be dealing with legal side and we have contractual obligations. We have particular things that we have to comply with. And then multitasking, giving different kinds of things for the, for the customer. Right, we're going to have a little brief look at the difference if we're dealing with institutional and government markets. Uh, government, if we're dealing with government agencies and all the things that would, the, the main things, and I suppose another one missing here would be the military, but certainly prisons, hospitals and schools, big institutions. What is the difference in the way that we would sell to consumers and businesses we've seen? So now we'll have a, just a brief look at how we would deal with governments. Many of the buying behaviours exhibited by organisations are similar to those of institutions and governments. However, there are certain special features in this part of the B2B market. Obviously, it is business to business. Overall, it's not dealing with an individual, but it is uh, a little different. Many institutions are characterised by having low budgets and captive clients. They already have their, their, their customers. They don't have to look for customers and, and, and effectively show off or produce brands or anything to impress the customers to come there. They're a captive market. People are always gonna go there. Hospitals decide what quality of food to buy for the patients. The goal isn't profit because the food is part of the total service package, but low quality food can damage the hospital's reputation. Governments typically require that sellers submit bids and most often award the contract to the lowest bidder. The US government bought goods and services of nearly $500 billion in 2016, making it the largest customer in the world. How the federal government, the US obviously we're talking of here, buys from small businesses. It's not always done through massive companies. Now, obviously if they're dealing with, uh, if they want to buy fighter planes and they're going through Boeing then yes obviously however there are so many things that governments require at every single level that they obviously have to deal quite a lot with small businesses so micro purchases with credit cards governments purchase of individual items under three thousand dollars are generally considered to be micro purchases now the advantage is they don't require competitive bids or quotes and agencies can simply pay using a government purchase card or credit card without involving a procurement officer, which is good to hear. 70% of all government purchases are for micro purchases under $3,000. In 2010, that represented $19 billion. A simplified acquisition process. Process. This is for purchases under $150,000. Now they can be purchased using a simplified purchasing procedures that involve less paperwork and fewer approval levels. Now the good news for small businesses is that the purchases above $3,000 but under $350,000 are also reserved or set aside exclusively for small businesses, which means that then, although they could get the, their particular products from larger businesses, it's considered uh, better to use small businesses to help the economy. Contracted by negotiations. This is more complex and time consuming process. In certain cases, when the value of a government contract exceeds $150,000 and when it necessitates a highly technical product or service, well, the government may issue a RFP. Typically, the government will request a product or service it needs and solicit proposals from prospective contractors uh, on how they intend to carry out the request at what price. 
So proposal and response to the um, RFP can be subject to negotiation after they've been submitted. If the government is merely checking into the possibility of buying, it may issue an RFQ, a request for quotation. In response to an RFQ by a pr prospective uh, contractor, is not considered an offer. So consequently, cannot be accepted by the government to form a binding contract. Seal bids. This method is used when the government buy it competitively and has very specific requirements. Agencies will issue an invitation to bid, an IFP. Much like the RFP in the commercial sector, businesses will then submit sealed bids that are opened by a contracting officer in a public setting, read, allowed and recorded. Yes, to avoid any um, illegal activity of uh, offering a um, getting backhanded uh, uh, money to award it to a particular contract. Contracts are awarded to the lowest bidder who is determined to be fully responsible to the needs of the government. The consolidating purchasing vehicles or consolidated purchasing vehicles, many agencies have common purchasing needs such as software office supplies. To achieve economies of scale, purchase of certain types of products or services are centralized. In this consolidated purchasing, Acquisition vehicles are typically used, most common being GSA, schedules or government-wide acquisition contracts called GWACs. These centralized buying vehicles are negotiated by the government with awards to many vendors and used by multiple agencies. And that can, uh, concludes uh, this section of business to business and government agencies. So I shall see you in the next class. Thank you.